after I did that video about the $40,000 grant for building an ADU in California, I got a ton of questions. A lot of you put questions in the comments, some of you texted me, and some of you even called me, which was great. It was nice to actually get those phone calls, but I couldn't answer all the questions. So I really wanted to get those questions for you answered. And today, I'm going to do that. Today I'm talking with Will Johnson, who is one of the mortgage lenders that is approved for the Cal HFA ADU grant program. And if I don't get all the questions answered or you think of more along the way, go ahead and put it in the comments below and I'll try to get you answers to those questions as well. So let's get to it. I'm here today with Will Johnson from Benchmark Mortgage, and he is one of the lenders that's on the California grant, the grant that is offering the 40,000. He's one of the lenders on the list and he's here to answer all the burning questions that everybody's <laughs> had. And yeah, so I'm going to ask some questions. If you think of any more, you can always put those in the comments and we'll try to get answers for those later. But here we go. Thank you. Why would anybody want an ADU? Why would they want to add an ADU to their property? Well, this is something I'm really passionate about. And, you know, I just want to state off, just sort of put a stake in the ground. You know, I think building an ADU is probably the best investment a homeowner can make, period. It's a great investment. What's driving a lot of the demand for ADUs, it's creating affordable housing. And that's really sort of the goal of the statewide ordinances. And secondly, it creates a very attractive income stream. I mean, real estate investors see that the cash out return on this is very, very attractive. And to give you a little bit of history is, you know, I have a lot of background in renovation financing. I've been doing that for over 10 years. So when I saw these ADU ordinances first come into play in 2017, 2018, I just knew this was going to be a huge um, opportunity. The biggest advantage is, is these ordinances really removed a lot of the barriers that um, inhibited building ADUs to begin with. The first one was parking. Every time we added another dwelling, we had to do to, to add offsite parking. That was a huge problem. It killed a lot of projects uh, dead on arrival. But the big thing is, is they started really making some financial incentives to make this really, really viable. So people may not be aware of, they're probably aware of permit costs, but there's this whole other fee structure called impact fees. And, and statewide, this is a statewide ordinance. So this trumps local ordinances. They removed a lot of the impact fees under 750 square feet. So mm -hmm. that's tens of thousands of dollars, tens to 50 thousands of dollars of savings right there. Secondly, is you're not required to provide direct utilities so you could feed off of the primary mm -hmm. dwelling. That can save another tens of thousands of dollars. Thirdly, your build costs. Like I'm in San Diego, it's around 325. This is in 2022. Uh, the Bay Area, it's more like 400. Um, mm -hmm. But when you compare those build costs to what we're paying for real estate, you might be able to answer this, but in San Diego, last year's average was over $600 a square foot. So real simple math here, if I can build yeah. at 325 <laughs> and the market's paying over 600 a square foot on average, right. we have a huge equity opportunity there. There's grant programs. I know we're going to talk about that, but yeah. you know, this is just a huge financial win. The last thing just to talk about from the ROI perspective is when you look at the rental marketplace, you know, that's a very constrained area as well. So the rental rates are very, very high. So this really creates a very, very attractive cash flow opportunity. And what's nice and exciting about this is we're really empowering homeowners, homeowners for the first time to participate in a program like this that wasn't available to them. Yeah. I mean, when you were mentioning a few things, it came to mind when, when we started looking into building one several years back before the parking requirement was removed, we were outside measuring our front yard, trying to figure oh. out where, where can we add a parking space that's required? Yeah. And we were just short a few feet and it just wasn't going to work. That was one thing. And another thing is besides just the cash flow 
potential that somebody could have. It also works really well for if you have elderly family that needs sure. needs a place to live. Maybe they you don't want to put mom in a home or dad in a home, but you know, you could put them in your backyard and take care of them without a huge expense. And maybe they can't afford to live where you live. We do live in an expensive state and expensive areas. So having them be able to move closer and keep those living expenses down is a huge benefit as well. When I look at, I do some examples on financing, you know, 600 square foot, one bedroom, one bath down here in San Diego at 325 a square foot. That's about $160,000. If I finance that, that adds about $925 to your mortgage payment. So what did I just do here? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, where can you find $925 a month? Anywhere. Nowhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Nowhere. I yeah. mean, nowhere. I don't want to throw out any yeah. areas of California, but, you know, somebody said jokingly, he says, you would have to go back in time <laughs> to get that, I to mean, get even, that rate. So even in the Central Valley, you can't get that. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, you know, affordability is just so yeah. profound here. There's no other way of, of achieving this. So, you know, when we're talking about taking care of family, I mean, this really hits home for me and seeing that we're empowering every kind of homeowner to participate in this kind of a program. Let's talk about the $40,000 grant that is only in California. So if you're in another state, I'm sorry, maybe your state will do it too. But for now, this is for people in California. So tell us, how did this come to be? Well, this is from Cal Hafa. So this is a California state funded grant fund is $100 million. It started out at the beginning of the year it was $25,000. And it had some low income maximums in order to qualify. And basically what happened is after a few months, we're just they just weren't getting any traction out of the program. Mm -hmm. And then the summer, I think May or June, they increased it to 40,000. But they also increased the income levels uh, for people to qualify. So like down here in San Diego, the grant was actually um, increased to $211,000 maximum. So this really just made a lot of people eligible into the program. You had to be owner occupied. You couldn't make over 211,000 and that's like combined income. And then the last thing is it requires um, financing, refinancing into a renovation loan type of loan. Yeah. That was one of the things with the, at the beginning with the income limits, if you already were struggling just to afford where you were living, taking out another loan didn't make it that attractive. But now with the income limits are higher, it makes it easier for people to qualify who can afford to add these ADUs and can't afford to add that extra debt. Okay, so somebody who wants to take advantage of the grant, what are the financial requirements for them to apply their credit score, all those things? Sure. So the Cal Hafa program has some just some really core basic requirements. A, you have to be a homeowner. B, you have to fall under the income limits. And those are stated on a per county basis. So mm -hmm. there's a list on the Cal Hatha website. I have a list available to me. You know, the range, like in San Diego, it's 211,000. Some of the Bay Area counties are over 300,000, as an example. And then some of the other smaller areas, I think it's about 185. So that's really just brought a lot of people eligible into the program. But the third one is, is, is it requires um, financing specifically into a renovation loan. And the reason why is these renovation loans set up an escrow account. Mm -hmm. So that construction budget needs to be itemized. It needs to be sitting in that escrow account. And then the ADU grant will also sit into uh -huh. that escrow account. Uh -huh. So what that does is that escrow account allows us to manage the disbursement of, of the funds. That's the requirements is we have to go into a renovation loans. Those are basically um, HUD has the 203K, Fannie Mae has a home style, uh, VA also has a renovation loan. And they operate very similarly in uh, in the overall process. So do you still have the same requirements? Um, like you're applying for a regular mortgage with the debt to income ratios. And do they have an equity requirement? Do they have to have a certain amount of equity in the home already? 
No, I mean, these sort of follow sort of your conventional loans. You can do this for a purchase or, mm-hmm. or refinance. So, I mean, it can come in as low as, you know, three and a half percent on some of these loans from an equity standpoint. You know, the debt to incomes, you know, have to be somewhere between, I think, in around 43 uh, percent, if I recall correctly. So somebody, let's say they, they're a first time home buyer. They don't already own a home and they want a home and they maybe they want to build the ADU so that they can live in the ADU while they rent out the main home. Can they apply for the grant during the purchasing process? Well, I would say yes, but there's a big but. You know, renovation loans require construction budgets. Sometimes we actually have to have stamped plans. So I don't know if you've been through permitting or putting together stamped plans, but that basically takes months. That's just not going to work in, under in an escrow. Yeah. 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 So that turns into a two-step process. Well, what I advise yeah. clients is purchase the property and then let's go through the formality, doing designs and permits. We have all the time in the world and, you know, you would be eligible for the grant under those kinds of circumstances. Okay. Great. So another question that I've seen a lot of people ask is, can you use the grant for a JADU? Everyone thinks it's only for the detached, is it? Or can they use it for a attached JADU? Requirements for the grant are um, pretty straightforward. And I don't want to say basic, but they don't really get into any specificity in terms of the type of ADU that you're building. So um, there's nothing that prohibits you for qualifying. And I just know for a fact, you know, we're converting garages and JADUs that are qualifying. All right. So this next question is huge. Like I get this question asked all the time. People believe that there are rental requirements, that they have to rent it for a certain amount, that they have to rent it for a very low amount for a certain amount of time, or they have to rent only to section eight, or they only has to be anyway. People believe that in order to get this grant, you have to rent it for a low income and or some other thing, or they can't have a family member move in, or they can't just build it and leave it there and use it for their own purposes. Is that true? No, no. I mean, you know, um, ADUs have sort of an inherent clause in there that it can't be rented out for short term or rental. So there's always that 30 day restriction, but that's in the ordinance. It's not in the grant. In the grant, you know, um, if you go on their website, homeowner has to fill out a one page affidavit that they are owner occupied. They're very, very concerned about that. But, Mm. you know, they're not regulating, you know, that aspect of the program. So based on when you mentioned the owner occupancy is do you know, is there like time frame that the owner has to It has to be owner occupied. Do they have to stay a year, two years? Is it circumstantial? You download a one page document. It's an affidavit from the CalHalfa website. I don't recall any kind of a time limit specified. You're just, you know, signing a document uh, that you're being truthful, that this is an owner occupied um, property. Um, it's a pretty clean um, looking document okay. that um, I don't recall that there's any kind of a time limit for owner occupancies. You know, I know in the statewide ordinances, well, that's sort of a side, a side issue, but they were, you know, they removed the owner occupancy for five years and then they were going to come back and revisit. But that's a different, different um, thing. That's a different issue. Yeah. Okay. Another question that comes up a lot is, that the grant funds can't be used for the actual construction. So a lot of people say, well, what can I use it for? So what can they use it for? So I always say it's up to $40,000 of pre-construction costs. You know, things that come along with pre-construction costs are designs, permitting costs, a lot of um, additional types of services and inspections, engineering, surveys, uh, types of services come into play. So again, it's up to $40,000. If it looks like, you know, you have like a balance, uh, and not hitting the $40,000, 
you can use uh, some of those balance of funds to go towards some of your financing costs into the loan. The key thing that I remember from talking to Cal Haffa, and I've heard them talk about this several times, is they cannot allow it to use for any kind of labor or material costs. Okay, that's what I've heard too. Not even an, a nail, a piece of wood, nothing. Another question is, what happens if somebody applies for it, gets the grant, starts the process, and then doesn't go through with building? Well, I haven't heard of anything. I've heard of dubious contractors, but I've not heard of any consequences that have come up. I mean, this program really sort of turned on in, in June mm -hmm. and where it really started to get some, some interest. So we're really sort of at the early phase uh, right. of, of this. And I've not heard any, any kinds of conditions coming up that has caused problems like like that. that kind of now, remember, I mean, we're putting, you know, the entire construction budget to sitting into in, in an yeah. escrow account. Yeah. Uh, that money is pretty much allocated for that. We don't release any of those funds to the contractor until work is actually performed. Um, I think that really goes a long way of safeguarding the overall integrity and completion of the project. That's true. That makes sense. So the entire budget for the project is already put into account ahead of time. So if someone's not going to get the grant, spend money on design and permits, and then not have the money because the money's already in that account set aside for it. That makes sense. I mean, you know, I've been managing renovation loans since 2009. I mean, we've had to dismiss contractors. We've had contractors resign you know, that's a headache, but, you know, we sort of look back and saying, okay, we still have a balance and, uh, you know, we, it's just a matter of hiring a contractor to complete the project. And, you know, the homeowner is, is protected because those funds are there and available. So there's different kind of loans that go along with the $40,000 grant. Can it be used with a 203k loan? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that's basically what we've been talking about um, all along because HUD 203k um, is a construction loan. So again, it can be used for a purchase or a refinance. So you're refinancing, you know, your loan balance, but we're adding the construction budget to it. And that construction budget is what sits in that escrow account. So it sort of follows everything that we've been been talking about. So mm. um, yeah, it's it's ideally, and this is this is sort of why, you know, Cal Haffa was was really um, sort of insisting to use these renovation loans because we have this escrow account. These escrow accounts uh, really protect the consumer and yeah, protects definitely. the integrity of the loan. So, I mean, I, I applaud that they utilize this because, I mean, I've seen it, you know, over the last 10 years, we've always finished projects, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, an important accomplishment in the construction yeah. trade, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question that, another one, oh. all these questions are ones people keep asking. Does it have to be a stick built, traditional built ADU? Can they use it to put in a prefab or modular type ADU that's already built? So the, the problem with the prefab is, I don't know if we have really much in pre-construction costs with a, a, a prefab. Uh -huh. So there's no design costs. That's true. So there could be permit costs. You know, the program is pretty silent, really doesn't address that you can't do it. I'm just sort of following some some logic here. Garage conversion, on the other hand, you know, that's construction. Garage conversions is, you know, is part of the ADU ordinances. So, you know, it would absolutely be available for a garage conversion. Okay. So there are several different lenders on the Cal Hoffa website that are offering, you know, part of this grant program. Are all of the offerings from each of the lenders the same? The interest rates the same, or can they be varied from one lender to the other? Generally speaking, most of them, you know, require refinancing into a renovation loan. I think uh, I looked at the list the other day, there was 19 lenders on there. And then there was like 
these other housing affordable um, entities. There's like another half a dozen of those on there. I can tell you most of them are sort of in the same uh, requirement that um, I'm with Benchmark Mortgage is, is we have to utilize these renovation loans. But there are some that will allow you to do a HELOC oh. as an example. So there's a couple of those that are out there and, and available. That is, let's talk about that for a second, because with the interest rates having been so low where they were, now that they're higher, there's a lot of homeowners that are reluctant to refinance at a higher rate just to get this $40,000 grant. But HELOC is a solution for them. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to be candid, they all are. I mean, I talk to customers. Yeah. <laughs> several times a day and same discussion is, you know, they have a low interest on their first and, uh, you know, refinancing to 6%. Although sometimes when we do sort of the whole analysis um, because of the attractive um, cash flow on the rental side, they still can pencil out. Yeah. Um, however, you know, we've done a lot of financing for people that did qualify for the grant program and, what really makes sense in this environment when you have that low interest on your first is to go with a HELOC uh, as a second mm -hmm. because, you know, it's interest only for the first 10 years. So that makes it very attractive, affordable during the construction period. And, you know, that takes about a year. And then once your construction's done, then you have income coming in and you can start utilizing that to really start paying down the principal. Yeah, definitely. I think that's when they changed that, it probably brought in a lot more applicants to the program. And so I wanted to mention that too, because at the beginning, not that many people applied for it because they had too many restrictions. This Then the interest rates going up were a problem. And now with being able to, the amount went up, the income limits went up, and now you can do, you don't have to refinance your first. I think it's brought a lot more interest. So I'm kind of hearing some information buzzing around that maybe they're going to run out and they're actually going to get rid of all the grants that are available. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've been on um, webinars for people that do know. And back on Tuesday, I heard an announcement that 1,200 are already being in process and that, you know, one of the other providers out there has stopped accepting applications, but they have sort of a waiting list as of Wednesday was over 600. So there's only 2,500 grants. So at this sort of clip, you know, we are anticipating my advising all of my clients that, you know, we're probably just days away of the fund being exhausted. That said, this might be the last opportunity for somebody to get in there and apply and get one of those grants secured for themselves. It's possible that they've talked about extending it, putting mm -hmm. more money in. I don't know where the money's going to come from, but it might happen. It seems like it's been a pretty successful thing that they've offered, so it might happen. But I'm just telling to anybody out there who is been on the fence about doing it. Now is the time to do it. There's no more time to waste. Apply it for it now because it just might go away and not be an option anymore. You know, one of the challenges is, you know, in order to apply for this, you pretty much have to have a construction budget, you know, in hand that, you know, mm -hmm. you can live with. And some people are just not at that at that stage yeah. yet. You know, mm -hmm. they're still in sort of a feasibility. They don't have designs contractor's not going to give you, you know, a final bid without, about uh, design. So, mm. you know, um, you know, I've had Cal Haffa tell us in sort of a cavalier way that uh, they think that they can go back and get more funding, but I'm frankly just not uh, banking on this. So um, we'll see. It, in retrospect, it sort of started off cold, got warm, and then got hot, and then got real hot. And I'm a little, I'm confused. Let's go back for one second. You said that people should already, if they're applying for it, they're already at a stage where they have the contractor. How are they getting that if they don't have the plans yet? If the grant is supposed to cover the plans, how are they going to get the contractor already involved to apply for the grant? Right. You know, you might have to come out of pocket for some of these funds and get reimbursed on them. But, you know, I've managed renovation loans. We need you know, a solid construction budget. When I managed the 203Ks, you know, we had to have a fixed price contract that the customer 
you know, excuse me, that the contractor can, you know, commit to. They're signing contracts with the borrower, with the lender, with HUD, that, uh, yeah. you know, that these are very, very specific, detailed uh, construction bids. And that's just sort of requirement for these loans. So that's interesting because that you said that you, so they can get reimbursed because I earlier on in this, you know, months ago, I had originally heard that if you did pay for anything out of pocket, you couldn't get reimbursed for those expenses, but that's apparently not the case. Cause this is a little bit of a chicken before the egg. Like how sure. do you, how do you move forward with this if you're wanting to do this? Yeah. So basically, you know, that 40,000 is going to sit in an escrow account. You know, you might have to come out of pocket for all of these costs and you'll get reimbursed on them. The lender wants to see the receipts and yeah. see them stamped. I mean, I've seen lenders say, okay, I see the invoice. It says paid on it. I want to see a copy of your checking account statement okay. showing money came out for that. Got it. So if somebody wanted to apply and they wanted to give you a call. Sure. So, you know, I have a process. They can certainly reach out to me by phone or email. I'll have that information, you know, available to you. Um, I send out a, a form that they can fill out, very brief form. And that really sort of gets the process going where I can do some immediate financial analysis, you know, look at their loan balance, look at the property and pretty much know what kind of a loan product we should be talking about. It'll mm -hmm. link directly to my um, appointment calendar to set up a call. And, you know, we could be looking at, you know, starting the pre-qualification process as soon as we wrap up that phone conversation. Well, thank you, Will, for all your information. This has really helped me and a lot of people understand and get some of these questions answered. Finally, I'll put your information, your phone number, Great. your email in the description. So somebody who wants to reach out to you, they can. And thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. I'm passionate about uh, ADUs and hopefully we can inspire some viewers to participate in the program. We're, we're here to help. I hope that some people definitely take advantage of it. It is, and I agree with you, you said at the beginning, it's one of the best investments people can make for their financial future. And I thousand percent agree, thousand percent. <laughs>